Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord hath sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Instruction came, God spoke to him and he, God remembered uh, what, the, uh, what uh, Amalek did to Israel and so he gave him instructions to go in there to kill everything that was living, moving, breathing. And uh, as the scripture goes on in verse 11, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Something must have went very wrong. For he is turned back from following me and hath, hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what, what, what meaneth, if you've really done what God has said to you, then, then what is this bleeding of the sheep? What is the, what are these animals that I am hearing? What's going on? And, and Saul said, uh, well, they have brought them from the uh, Amalekites for the people, the people. So now he's blaming it on the people. The people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we utterly destroyed. Well, number one, who told you to spare the sheep, the oxen? Nobody, ain't nobody told you that. And now you're going to blame it on the people. Verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay. And I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him with his cocky self, say on. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And didn't the Lord anoint you king over Israel? When did that happen? When he was little in his own sight. Verse 24, and Saul said unto Samuel, after a whole lot of things, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared, here we go, the people, and I obeyed their voice. Who told you to obey the voice of the people? You are to obey the, obey the voice of God. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee but thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and the, because of that the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel and as Samuel turned about to go away he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and he rent it and Samuel said unto him the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou he said, God has taken it from you and he's given it to a man that is better than you are. And also the strength of Israel. He will not lie and he will not repent for he is not a man that he should repent. And then he said, I have sinned. I have sinned, but I still want you to honor me. The audacity. I still want you to honor me. I pray thee, honor me before the elders. Honor me before the people. In other words, I know you're mad at me and I know we're done and I know you're through with me. But I want to ask you to make it look like we're, we're just like we've always been. <sighs> Turn again with me that I may worship the Lord he is so confused and so conflicted here verse 35 and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death nevertheless Samuel mourned for Saul and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel it starts with the verse saying God had made him king anointed him to be king and at the end of that chapter God is sorry for what he did here he is, this great leader, this great man. Whew, but he's got some heart issues. 
Look to your neighbor on your right and say, neighbor, this is a heart problem. It's not an anointing problem. It's not a calling problem. This is a heart problem. Ask your neighbor, neighbor, do you have a heart problem? Spirit of God, have your way in here today. Here we come, Lord. We are in your operating room. I ask that you take the scaffold of your spirit. And I ask that you would dig around in our lives. And if you find anything that would threaten what you've called us to do, what you've meant for us to be, anything that would get in your way, take it out, oh God. Bring us into alignment. Lord, as I preach your word today, I ask that you would help it to find every hearer that is in this room and every hearer that is watching at home. Let this word run through them like you have allowed it to run through me in the last several hours. God, I ask you to do it. Have your way and make us better when it is all said and done so that we can serve you in a way that you are pleased. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. On your, way, on your way down to your seat, touch your neighbor and say, this is a hard problem. Not a hard, but a heart. This is a hard problem. <clears throat> the first king in Israel was a man whose name was, was Saul. We just read about him. But before Saul came into the picture, all the people had ever known and all the people had ever, that they had ever been, the only leader that they had ever been led by was the man who was a prophet and his name was Samuel. Unlike the other nations of the earth, unlike the other people, they had never had a king. And God had always, from the get-go, been their only king. But now that they, now they have decided that they want to be like everybody else and they want to have a king that is visible, a king that they can see, a king that they possibly someday could touch, or they want a, want a king that other people, that they could point to and say, oh, that's our king. So the elders, they got together and they conspired and they went to the prophet Samuel and they asked him to provide for them a king. Samuel at first was indignant and I think, I guess I understand that. Uh, however, in spite of all of the indignation that was within him, he sought the Lord on their behalf. And in doing so, the Lord spoke to him and he said, hearken unto the voice uh, and make them a king. Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. So following the, uh, precisely the instructions of the Lord, and that really does matter. Details matter when it comes to the voice of God. And so following precisely in the instructions of the Lord, the prophet Samuel anointed Saul as, uh, uh, Saul as their king. Now, Saul was a very stately man. Uh, the scripture tells us that he was head and shoulders above all the other men that were in Israel. It also tells us that he was a goodly man, which means he was charming. He had a way with words. He was, you know, just that, that perfect kind of guy. Uh, and, and his presence alone had a very commanding spirit. He had a very commanding presence. He was, by, by all by himself, he was a force that was to be reckoned with. The people feared and followed and they adored adored him. They gave him their loyalty and he gave them himself. His success, I said all of that to say that his success should have been sealed. It should have been sealed because God had selected him, the prophet had anointed him, and the people loved and cheered loudly for him. So he should have actually lived happily ever after. But pride and egotism and also the abuse of power has led him down a staircase that would ultimately lead him into degradation and into his own ruin. Out of 
all of the men that we have read about or talked about or that are even listed in the Bible, none of the men have been given more opportunities to build for themselves a successful life. And none has ever missed so many opportunities as Saul did. Saul not only missed uh, great opportunities, but he deliberately, over time, began to abuse those opportunities. So because of that, his son rose in splendor, but it set in the darkness of night. In the early years, he was a very humble man. He practiced self-control. He was a man of restraint. He was a man that was appreciative and he was a man that was grateful and he should have become a great ruler, but instead he became somebody who trusted him, himself and in his, own, in his own self more than he trusted in God. Isn't it funny how God can bring you to the place? He can anoint you for the place. He can talk you through what you need to do. He can give you favor in the sight of the people that are in the place. And somewhere along the way, if you're not careful, something happens and now you can no longer trust God, but you put all your trust in yourself. He was born head and shoulders above all of Israel and he died as somebody that should have been pitied. Such is the dichotomies of life. You can be so high one minute and be so low the next. You can be up one day and be so down the next. You can be in, so, you can be in one minute and so out the next. His reign began triumphantly, but it ended tragically. Mm. But you know what? I'm not really surprised because that kind of stuff happens all the time. We don't always talk about it. But I said we don't always talk about it. Thank you. We don't always talk about it because we want to, we want to talk about the triumph. But, but it happens nonetheless. From pulpits to political figures to school principals. I mean, you just think about it. It happens from CEOs. It happens all the time. So somebody might say, well, were, were they ever good people? Probably so. But power can potentially pervert even good people. I said power has the potential to pervert even you. And me. Saul was, he was a good man. He was anointed to be the king. Any one of us that has ever been anointed by God, because he was anointed, he was appointed by God. So therefore, anybody under the sound of my voice that has ever been appointed by God or anointed by God to do anything, I mean, whether it's from running a business, from building a family, from raising up a church, from whatever it is, we ought to, the, hearing his story ought to make us shake within our shoes anytime that we read about Saul because his life points out to us in a very vivid way that it's possible to be at the pinnacle of your life in one minute and down in the pits in your life the very next minute. His life is a reminder to all of us that the first place when God calls you, the first place he calls you is not to an assignment. The first place he calls you is not to a people. The first place that God calls you when he calls you is he calls you to himself. And no matter how far and no matter how high that he takes us, we must always remember that our original call was a call to him. Saul's life reminds me that I should never, ever, ever take for granted that there is a touch of God that is on. As I read his story, I started saying, God, let me never take for granted 
that you have touched me with your hand, that you've touched me with your glory, that there is an anointing on my life. I never ever want to take for granted just because I might go into a place and, and, and somebody might say, oh, your, your ministry has blessed me. Don't ever let me take for granted, oh God, because it is really not me. It's that the excellency must be of God and not of us. Saul's life reminds me that all power belongs to God. I said all power belongs to God. Even that little bit of power that he gave you to complete your assignment and now you think we're all that in a bag of chips. Uh, let me tell you, even that power belongs to God. So we need to learn from Saul's mistakes because if we don't, we are destined to repeat them. Look at somebody and tell them, I want to learn. I want to learn. His life and his reign, little by little, gradually disintegrated. His mind became poisoned by jealousy and fear and rage. Never mind God had anointed him. Never mind that the people loved him. Never mind that the prophet uh, had, 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 had spoke over his life. He is still in his mind. He's still battling rage and jealousy and fear. He was estranged from his son. He was estranged from his daughter. All because they loved this man whose name was David. They loved his son and his daughter loved David. You know, the David that served him. The David that honored him. The David that protected him. The David that when he was troubled by tormenting spirits would come into the room and bring his harp and begin to sing and begin to worship. And it brought relief to the tormented mind of this man. That David, that David who was determined in his heart not to divide that man's kingdom, even if it meant he would seal his eyes and he would seal his lips to all the injustices that he personally experienced and it was Saul's paranoia that that David that, 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 that drove that David uh, to, uh, to a place where he had to run for his own life it was his it was Saul's paranoia for that David that drove him to attempt something that was really utterly impossible and that was to kill a man that Jehovah but God himself took pleasure in him. A man that Jehovah God had chosen to protect. And now Saul is trying to kill him. Tell somebody next to you, don't waste your time coming after me. I'm the apple of his eye. He loves me with an everlasting love. He, I'm his favorite child. Sometimes I, he loves me so much that I feel like I'm an only child. Oh, so don't waste your time coming after me. Don't waste your energy. Don't waste your wind. Don't waste your spit. Don't waste anything. Because God has anointed me to live and not die. And in, the, and in the end, because he was like that toward David, in the end, he lost his kingdom. But, but he lost so much more than his kingdom. He lost everything that matters in life because he lost his family. If you lose your family, let me tell you something. That is a loss that will take you years and years to try to calculate and understand. He lost his family and he lost his future. Oh, the Bible says how the mighty have fallen. And Saul fell so hard that all of the king's horses and all of the king's men could not put this king back together again. And the thing that makes this Saul scenario so sad is the fact that in spite of the many enemies that were after him, in spite of the many people that hated him, in spite uh, 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 over time of the many people that really could have killed him, that's not how he died. He self destructed yes 
He was wounded by enemies. Yes, he was attacked. And yes, they inflicted great pain on him. But at the end of the day, Saul was destroyed by his own sword. Listen, I'm here today to warn somebody under the sound of my voice that you need to stop focusing on your foes. And what you need to do is start focusing on fighting yourself. I said you need to focus on fighting yourself. We spend entirely too much time focusing on what others did to us. They might have wounded you. They might have caused you pain. They might have hurt you. But let me tell you today, they cannot destroy you. So I'm warning you today, not so much about your enemy. I'm warning you about yourself. I'm warning you and me about the decisions that we are making in our very own life that can lead us into self-destruction. This mighty man who was chosen to be king, anointed to be king, the mighty man that multitudes followed and admired, the mighty man that led the armies of God, this mighty man who was surrounded by troops and horses and chariots and archers and spear throwers and, and, and all kinds of people that loved him, the man that was surrounded by a powerful warriors, the man that was fearless has now for the very first time in his military career he has become fearful because he looks up and he sees the enemy positioned to attack him how did that happen distraction distraction let me back that up how did that happen one step at a time it's not like he was standing at the, at the top of the scare, staircase and just bypassed all the stairs and fell to his own death. It happened one step at a time and there's no way in the world that that should happen like that in the Bible. And we call ourselves Christians and us not reach into the text and find out all of the steps that this man went through so that it possibly might could protect us from making all of the mistakes that he's made. Look at somebody and tell him I came to learn today. How did it happen? It happened because of distraction. Uh, look at your neighbor and tell them distraction is destructive. Saul was on this ridiculous pursuit uh, of David and he was so on it that it caused him to abandon his usual normal strategy. It, it, it caused him to allow himself to be lured into an indefensible position. Be careful, my sisters and my brothers, that the enemy cannot lure you into an indefensible position position. I need about four or five people up here real quick. I wasn't going to do this, but it just came to my mind. Circle. I need about four or five. Uh, give me five people. One, two, three, four, five. I got them. I got them all. And I need, uh, yeah, I need one more. Come on, Kristen. I need one more. I want y'all to make a circle right up here, if you will. Just make a circle. Kristen, get in the middle of the circle right here. Your picture paints a thousand words, so I want you to see this. Okay, the, here is Saul. He's reigning. He's surrounded by people that love him. Y'all just act like you're talking to Saul and praising him and telling her how worthy she is and, and all of that stuff. But there is an enemy. Uh, he might not be in the middle, uh, a whole, around the circle, but there is an enemy that is within the vicinity. So I'll be the enemy so that I, you won't think bad of nobody else. But while they are talking to him and, and, and while they are praising her, uh, I am on the outside and I'm like, uh, I, I want you. I want you. There's so much outside of this, of this circle. There's so much that I, I, I want to lure you. And, and, and she can shake it off for a little while. But if I keep getting close and if I can just 
touch her and I can break into the, I don't even have to break into the circle. I can say so much that she will walk out of the circle all by herself because I have lured her into a lesser position. Are y'all hearing me? Surrounded by greatness, surrounded by people that have a heart for her, but the enemy is crafty. I say, Thank y'all. I said the enemy is crafty and if you're not careful, he'll pull you out of the place God has assigned you into a place of safety. So now he has allowed him himself to be lured out into this indefensible position and which has caused him to be forced to fight his enemies on their terms. Had he have stayed in his own circle, had he have stayed in the place that God had assigned him, should the enemy have come in, his people would have fought for him. They would have protected him. And if he ended up having to fight himself, he would have been fighting on his own turf, which means he could have fought on his own terms. But now he has come out, so he's having to fight the enemy on the enemy's terms and the enemy's terms. And as he is in the fight, he's watching. He's watching the blood of his own kids spill onto the ground. And he finally comes to grips with the fact that he is not going to come out of this alive. So what does he do? Rather than die by their sword, the Bible said that he fell on his own sword. <laughs> now, most of the time, when you tell somebody's story, you begin at the beginning. However, I think in order to really paint the picture clear, uh, the, the, uh, to, to paint the picture of this man's life on a clear canvas, I think you will appreciate the fact that I began at the end. And that's what I've done because I want, I want you to see today that his decision to self-destruct was a long time coming. It was a long time coming. Saul made this fatal mistake of placing his own judgment above the Lord's judgment. Are you following me? And what happens is that it created this big breach between him and God. The God that had called him, the God that anointed him, the God that had appointed him, it created a breach between him and the voice of God in his life, which was Samuel. This breach between the monarch and his mentor, this brief, uh, a breach between Saul and Samuel uh, would be uh, the beginning. Somebody say the beginning. It's just the beginning of this downward spiral that he is taking. So now, are you ready to look at his life? I said, I know there's a game today, but now are you ready to look at his life? Just beware. I know, somebody say, Pastor knows there is a game today. But I also know I don't want your blood on my hands. So if you have to leave, you can get up and go. So, so we've established that he was chosen. We've established that he was anointed. We've established that he looks like a king, that he acts like a king, that he walks like a king, carries himself with confidence like a king would. And everybody that, that even thought about raising up against him was terrified to do it because when God does anoint you to do something, he will always destroy the yoke of you your enemy. Anybody that comes against you when God has set you in the place that he wants you to be, anybody that comes after you, God will destroy them. Your enemies actually are a big clue to you as to how anointed and how appointed that you are. 
are because of how they die when they come after you. They may not physically die, but they lose their influence. They lose power. They lose prestige. Why? Because you touched the wrong person. Saul was anointed and everybody knew it. He was courageous. He was powerful. He was never intimidated and he was never threatened. His sword was fierce and whenever he raised up his sword, somebody was going to die. Saul could not be defeated. He could not be defeated because God was on his side. And if God be for us, he is more than the world that is against us. And as long as the two of them, God and Saul, and Saul and God were harmonious, no weapon that formed against him was able to prosper. No enemy could defeat him. No foe could overthrow him. No army could overtake him. And the same is true in my life and in your life life when you and God are harmonious no weapon formed against you can prosper and every tongue that rises up against you he will condemn it and when you and God are united I don't care how many people try to bring you down a thousand can fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall come not come nigh your dwelling so knowing that if I were the enemy I would not focus my efforts on fighting and defeating you <laughs> instead I would work on breaking the two of you up I would work on breaking up your relationship with the God that empowers you. I would work on separating you from the one that secures your success. I would try to rock you to sleep and I would try to get you to take him for granted. I would try to get you to move from relationship over into religion. I would try to get you to become selfish and self serving. You deserve to be done the right way. You're awesome. You, I, I would get people to clap for you so loud that all you could hear was the clapping of the people. I would get you so distracted and so distant and, and so audacious and so arrogant. Perhaps if I could get you to possibly think that everything will always be be as it has always been, then maybe, just maybe, I can isolate you and I can attack you and I can strip you from your armor. I can defeat you and decapitate you and actually make what the Bible says sport of you. I could make you look like a fool because you have forgotten to remember that it is God and not you who is the reason that you are blessed like you are blessed for it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves it is his hand and his holy arm that has gotten us the victory look at somebody and tell them don't ever forget to remember Saul was so anointed that even in his backslidden state, even in his disobedient, rebellious state of mind, when he was falling on his own sword and it didn't completely kill him, he looked up to his armor bearer and he said, finish me, finish me off. But he was so, even in his backslidden state, he was so anointed that his armor bearer refused to touch him. He was already almost 
dead. But his armor bearer was determined that, sir, if you die, you will not die at my hands. Look at somebody and tell them, keep the blood off of your hands. I said, keep the blood off of your, be careful when it comes to God's anointed. Leave them in the hands of God. The fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the evangelist, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher are all in the hands of God. If they're wrong, God knows how to get them, but never allow their blood to be on your hands. And David, when you look up and you see javelins that are coming in your direction, all I'm telling you is just duck and survive. Just duck and survive. Just, oh, just duck. Oh, just duck. Keep ducking and survive. Everything that comes after you, every javelin that is aimed at your head, hey, just duck and ask God to give you the rhythm and the timing to the duck and survive. Because it is only a sign that promotion has come to your house when the javelins start coming at you. Duck, survive, and no promotion is knocking on my it's knocking on my door. Woo! The kingdom is in transition. You gotta know that when that happens, that there is a kingdom that is in transition. You gotta know that destiny has tagged you and you are it. So whatever you do, don't forfeit what God has for you because they, Saul, has forfeited what God has for him. But you don't know how they did me and you don't know what they put me through and you don't know what they said and you don't know how stupid that they made me look. No, I don't know. But guess what? That doesn't matter either for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed in us, to us, for us, and poured out on us. Nobody can mess that up for your life but you. It is not, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but it is not what they are doing that is killing you. I said, it is not what they are doing to you that is killing you. It's what the enemy is getting you to do to yourself that is killing you. And it really, at the end of the day, you gotta know this. Hit somebody and tell them you gotta know this, you gotta know this. That it doesn't matter what people say. And it really doesn't matter what they feel about you. And it does not matter what they think. Or it does not even matter what you heard that they are saying about you. It doesn't matter that people are talking behind your back. It doesn't matter that they don't like you. It doesn't matter that they don't think you are good enough for them. That position. It does not matter that they don't think you are good enough to be his wife or that you are good enough to be her husband. It really does not matter. I said it really does not matter. You will never die because of their sword, but be careful because you will die because of yours. It was not their sword that killed Saul. It was his own sword. It was the sword that he failed to use to obey God and kill King Agag. That is the, what ultimately destroyed him. I want to give you some of the reasons 
that Saul found himself in such a place that he found himself in Gilboa. I know I didn't read all of this to you, but I'm hoping it makes you hungry that you'll go home and start searching it out for yourself. This is where, this is what happened that found him in Gilboa. It's what he did that found him in an undefensible position. It is what he did that found him in the valley where the enemy was watching for him and was, a, was making an attempt to cut his head off from his shoulders. It's important that we learn from the mistakes of the downward spiral of a great man. If you assume somebody's not great and they fall, you're like, child, I don't even know. But if you assume somebody is great and they fall, we need to figure out what happened. So one of the, thank you, Pastor Jeremy. So one of the first steps, write this down, one of the first steps of Saul's downfall was his disobedience. The word of the Lord came to him through Samuel saying, attack the Amalekites, destroy them, spare nothing. Kill the men, kill the women, kill the children, kill the ox. Kill the sheep and kill the livestock and get out of town. Why? Because God remembered what they had done to Israel. So he sends Saul in. Oh, can I tell you that the battle really is the Lord's. So God sends, even when you have forgotten about it, God said, I never forgot about it. And so he sends his man in to utterly destroy these people. And Saul did what he was asked to do. Well, almost. He almost did. Have you almost done what God has asked you to do, but you stopped just a little short? Oh, God, help us. Instead of killing King Agag, and ki and instead of that, he, he saved him. And he saved the best livestock that they had. Woo. And, and let me tell you something. God sees what he has done. And so God sends a prophet to him to confront him. And it happens to be Samuel. And so when Samuel walks in the door, you know, because the guilty dog always barks first. So when Samuel walked into the door, Saul said, blessed be the name of the Lord, for I have done as he has commanded. And he is lying right in the face of the prophet of God that anointed him to be in the position he was in. And Samuel says, if you did what God said for you to do, why do I hear livestock? Why do I hear them in my ear? And so rather than admit it, he starts making excuses for it. Do you hear me today? Rather than admit admit it and starts making excuses for it. God help us. If we have to, if it's ours to own, the best thing in the world you can do is own it. But because he didn't, takes us to the second step in his downfall, which is number two. He's dishonest. And all liars shall have their part. Y'all ain't helping me. Now he's dishonest. He was disobedient and his disobedience led to his dishonesty. And this is such a slippery slope because whenever you've been dis... And y'all probably know people like this. But whenever you've been dishonest long enough, you start to believe your own lies. And we all know people like that. 
you start to believe your own lies and, and, and you lose the ability not just to, to, to tell other people the truth. You lose your ability to tell yourself the truth. You, you, you lose the ability to discern the difference between the truth and a lie. And when you believe your own lies, you deceive yourself. And what you end up doing is you alienate yourself from the one and only God that has the power to help you right where you are. It's amazing to me how many people today disobey God so blatantly. He will say one thing. They will do something completely opposite. And then they got the nerve to get an attitude with God because he does not respond to them while they are in the mood, while they are moving in all of this disobedience. FYI, disobedience is when you think you can get to the right place by taking the wrong road. You cannot get there like that. Saul was disobedient and because of it he failed. He failed and because he failed to own it himself he has become dishonest. So not only is he disobedient, not only is he dishonest, but here's number three. He is arrogant. He knows when the prophet walks in his house, he knows exactly what he did. And yet he still has the audacity to say, what are you, what are you talking about? I have obeyed God. I read that to you today. He said, I mean, look, I, I killed all the people and I, I only spared the king and I, I only spared the livestock so that we could come back with this livestock and sacrifice it to your God. <laughs> okay, so now all of a sudden, he has become conscious about worshiping God. You never worried about worshiping God, Saul, but now you figure this is what's going to cover things up for me. Uh, you, 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 now, now, all of a sudden, now you want to get religious. Now you want to say, I'm one of them. I'm one of the worshipers. What part of utterly destroy did you not get, Sir Saul? Do you not? understand that partial be obedience is complete disobedience I don't feel no help from this section right here do you not understand that when you bring God 5% and you call yourself obedient, you are not obedient. You are disobedient because partial obedience is complete disobedience. Uh, of course, of course, of course he gets it. He knows exactly what he has done but you can still hear his arrogance coming through in verse 16. For the prophet Samuel said, that's enough. Let me tell you what God has told me about you. Go ahead, just go ahead, say on. And that's exactly what he did because a real prophet is not intimidated by your arrogance. No, a real prophet will bring you the word of the Lord, even if it does make you angry. He said to him, boy, when you were little, in your own eyes, before you ever became the king, before you ever got your title, before you ever got this promotion in your life, before you felt like you deserved what happened to you, before you got up and then got amnesia and you forgot who blessed you, when you were little in your own eyes, when you knew how to be humble, when you knew how to be nice, when you knew how to be thankful, when you knew how to shake off that complaining spirit, I bless your life. And it 
was all of those things and all of those characteristics about you that made me bless you in the first place. And now you're going to get arrogant over the things that I could snap my finger and take every last one of them out of your life. Seriously, so. Seriously, now you want to just come up in here and think you're going to make me take a sacrifice that I ain't asked for? That's not what I asked for. I told you not to touch anything in there. Oh, but now you think you're going to worship me with this. Oh, this is good. This will be pleasing in the sight of God. Listen, you'd be surprised to know just how many people that God wants to bless, but he cannot bless because you now are too important. And you got to be careful because if you, if God, if, if you find yourself in a blessed state, you got to be careful and make sure that you don't get blessed and then get crazy too and end up losing everything that made God say, I, that's why. I wanted to bless you to begin with because your spirit was humble your heart was broken and all of those things made me know that you would be sensitive to people on every level but now because you have become important and people sing your praises and you make decisions with great power now you have lost your humility let me tell you something church I know this there are a lot of things that you can lose in life and still survive but humility is not one of them look at your neighbor and say whatever you do stay humble holler at him whatever you do stay humble let me tell you, I don't care where God takes you. I don't care how high you go. You got to be able to walk with kings and then turn around and still have a common touch. I said, you got to be able to walk where kings walk and still come and have a common touch. Don't get up and get amnesia. When you were little in your own eyes, he blessed you. Blessed you because you were humble. Blessed you because you were grateful. Blessed you because you were thankful. Blessed you simply because you flushed every complaining spirit that you had. You, you brought every bit of that under subjection to the Holy Ghost that was in you. He blessed you when you were just glad to be in the number. I want you to look at everybody and tell them, don't forget to be thankful. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. And also tell them, don't forget to be nice. You would be shocked to know how many people have forgot how to be nice. You lost your marriage because you forgot how to be nice. You lost your friends because you forgot how to be nice. You lost the respect of people around you because you forgot how to be nice. What is it that when we get blessed and then we get this stupid spirit of entitlement that comes on us? Entitlement is what makes you arrogant and once arrogance gets down in your heart you start thinking that you deserve this and I deserve that and I have a right do you know who I am I have a right to be treated special do you know that there are people that are in the church today that have had God's favor on their life and now they think that when they come to church, they are doing him a favor? I didn't say this church, but, but if the shoe fits, wear it. 
I mean, you got a million things that you could do, but you sacrifice all of those millions of things, and now you're here. Yeah, but you're arrogant. Y'all are quiet. I don't even care. Okay? Woo! Because your blood is washing off my hands as I speak. Saul was boldly arrogant. But we are too. We are too. We come to his house on his day. The day he made. And we ration out our time. When, if he doesn't give you your next breath, I don't care how fast your car is or your motorcycle or your speedboat, if he don't give you your next breath, you will not breathe. But we're going to ration out our time. We're going to ration out. Oh, I only have so much attention span. We're going to ration out our money. We're going to ration out our praise. Ooh. I can't sing another song. If y'all sing that song one more time, that's it. I'm, I'm done with y'all. We, we ration out our worship. You know what all that is? It's arrogance. And you're about to be in trouble because the only reason I gave you something to do and the only reason I gave you your house and the only reason I gave you the palace, Saul, the only reason I gave you the career and the power and the position and the authority was because you were humble. I overheard you when you were walking around in the dorm saying, God, if you'll just get me through school, I promise I will bless you. I overheard you when you were in the kitchen washing dishes saying, Lord, I thank you for this house. I thank you for where I am. I thank you that there's a roof over my head. I overheard you, he said, while you were doing the dishes. I overheard you, he said, when you were on your job that paid you not enough. And I chose to bless you with another one that was more than enough because you prayed Praise me in what was not enough. I overheard you calling Jehovah Chira, calling me Jehovah Rapha. When you were little in your own eyes, when you prayed for an opportunity and didn't just expect there to be an opportunity. But now, 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 Saul. So. You've become a part of the system. You've become condescending. You've become prideful and arrogant and your arrogance will destroy you. My question to you today is what are you doing in your life that is killing you? Sila. Think on that for a moment. What are you doing in your life? That one little adjustment would shift your whole attitude. I don't know the exact square footage of this sanctuary. But what I do know is that one flick of a switch would change the entire environment. One touch, one minor adjustment, one flip of the light, one flip of the thermostat, and a cold place could become warm. And a dark place could become light. And a lit room could become dark. All with one flip of a switch. I wonder how our whole life could change with just the flip of a switch. How could it happen? One little adjustment. I've seen it take people from sickness to health. One little adjustment. 
can take you from emptiness to fullness. One little adjustment can take you from being powerless to being powerful. One little adjustment can take you from struggle and land you in the middle of success. One little adjustment could take you from being unemployed to the place where now you are employing other people. I want you to look at two people and say, flip the switch. Whatever it takes, flip that switch. Switch! Flip it! Write this down. He was disobedient. He was dishonest. He was arrogant. Number four, he was rebellious. Which means to boldly refuse to obey. The Bible says that rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. So when Saul spared the life of Agag, that was not a mistake. Oh, that was not an oversight. That was, oh, I've just misunderstood. That was not a miscommunication. That was Saul using his power, using his authority to manipulate the instructions of the Lord. And anytime you manipulate what God said and you move in the direction of your personal agenda, you are in rebellion and you are playing a witch's game. Saul was rebellious and it led him to his own demise. He broke his own rules and he turned around and consulted with the witch because witches always have a way of finding each other. I know you want Pastor Jerome Glenn right about now digging dirt up out of the tub but you ain't got him today, you got me. I'm holding up a mirror in your face. I'm holding up a mirror in my face saying, God help me not to make one stupid mistake that could ruin everything that you have appointed me to have. He is disobedient, he is dishonest. He's arrogant, he's rebellious. Number five, he is in denial. How could he sit up there and deny what he had done in the face of the prophet of God? He's denying everything. And that's how I know he is no longer a good leader. Because a good leader knows how to assume responsibility for his mistakes. And that act right there tells me, you're no longer a good leader. God, we need church leaders. We need political leaders. We need school leaders. We need workplace leaders. We need home leaders. We need business leaders who will come out of denial, assume responsibility, and change the course of destiny because denial affects everybody. Tell your neighbor, denial is destructive. And you can never change what you refuse to take responsibility for. Denial has destroyed homes and marriages and families, careers, lives, purposes, destiny. Saul is just a bully and he's looking for somebody that he can blame. And whenever Samuel Backs his behind up into the corner. He comes out swinging his sword. Well, it's the people's fault. No, sir, Mr. Saul, it is not the people's fault. It is your fault. 
God anointed you so that you would not give way to the pressure of people. Saul was possessed with the spirit of blame and you got to watch out for that spirit because it will set itself up inside of you as Lord and King. It will set itself up in your children. It will set itself up in your co-workers. It will set itself up in the, the people that you worship with. There is a soul spirit that is in the earth today. The Democrats blame the Republicans. The right wing blames the left wing. The gay community blames the straight community. The African Americans blame the white people. Pro-life blames pro-choice. Pulpits are blaming people in the pews and people in the pews are blaming people in the pulpits. It is a Saul spirit. Saul is in complete denial. And ultimately it will destroy him. And what's sad is all he had to do was be honest. All he had to do was say, I messed up. I missed the mark. All he had to do was say, I was wrong and I'm so sorry. That's all he really had to do, but he doesn't. Why? Because he's in denial. And when you're in denial, you will never confront your own issues. Saul is lying to himself. He's gifted, he's talented, he's greatly accomplished, but his gift has taken him to a place that his character is not big enough to keep him. Because there is a difference between your character and your morality. Okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm just picking right now. So, Your morals are your value systems. Your morals are those things that are deep inside. Your, your morals are the value systems that you believe. But your character, it's where you live outwardly. What you believe inwardly. And some people believe things inwardly. But they cannot live those things outwardly. Because they don't have character. You believe that as a Christian, you shouldn't be sleeping around, but you do. You believe that you shouldn't be getting drunk. I believe that, but you do. You believe that you should hold your tongue and stop gossiping and stop backbiting. You believe that. But you do. That's because you have morals. But you don't have character. Because you believe it inwardly. But you can't help but do it outwardly. Woo, that's good teaching right there. Saul was a man with character issues. But he could not deal with them because he was in denial. Yes. You're a drug addict, but you're in denial. You're an abusive husband, but you're in denial. You're a manipulative wife, but you're in denial. You're addicted to pornography, but you're in denial. And you can never be any better than you are right here today until you admit it's me. It is me. It is me. I am the one to blame. He didn't make me do it. She didn't make me do it. Church hurt didn't make me do it. I am at fault and I'm ready to own this myself because I don't want blame and I don't want denial to be the sword in my life that ultimately kills me and my promise and my purpose and my future and my family and my finances and my destiny and all of my dreams. I want to kill denial before denial kills me. And I'll close with this church. 
You see, Saul had a heart trouble. The Bible said that when God chose him, he gave him a new heart. But the problem is that new heart has got a hold of power. And now his new heart has become a, a, a polluted with corruption. Why? Because of disobedience, dishonesty, arrogance, rebellion, denial. And you couldn't see it by merely looking on the outside. But it was his heart that caused him to lose his kingdom. You couldn't tell it by looking at him. I mean, if you, and, and then if you think about it for just a second, he was replaced by a man who was morally worse than he was. Okay, I know we love David. I love we, we sing his songs and I know all that. But he was replaced by David and Saul never had the kind of moral mess that David had in his life. David's whole entire house was a mess. He had babies by everybody. His son raped his daughter. He killed his enemies and he killed his friends. When he killed Uriah, who was a man that was loyal to him, he killed Uriah because he wanted Uriah's wife. And yet God says, I'm taking the kingdom out of your hands and I'm giving it to a man that is better than you. That's confusing. That's confusing to us. But it's confusing to us because man looks on the... <laughs> but God looks on the heart. And while David had a mess in his house, he didn't have a mess in his heart because David was quick to fall on the altar and say, forgive me, forgive me. Saul's life may not have been as messy as David's was, but his heart was filthy. What is the difference? What is the difference between the two? Saul couldn't repent because he was in denial. Repent from what? I did nothing wrong. But David was different. He would say against thee and thee only have I sinned. Created me a clean heart and renewing me a right spirit. Oh God, thou knowest my foolishness. You know my sins. They are not hidden from you. Hear me, oh God, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to your tender mercies. You have tender mercies. Turn in my direction. Hear my cry, oh God, and attend unto my prayer. David knew how to repent because he would not live in denial. He knew how to repent. And because he knew how to repent, God said, I will kill Saul and his filthy, nasty heart. And I will raise up David because even though he messes up, he really wants to get it right. <laughs> oh! that my friend is what real worship is all about that's what real worship is all about it's not perfect people singing a perfect song to a perfect God it's imperfect people who mess up and they come to a perfect God and say hear my cry oh God attend unto my prayer oh God forgive me Deal with my life. Deal with my arrogance. Deal with my denial. 
deal with my disobedience. I tell you today, and I stop, that repentance is a gift. It's a gift from God. And when God offered it to Saul, he could not receive it. But David, who was way worse than Saul, accepted the gift. He repented and he became the recipient of the kingdom. If the word has touched you, jump up on your feet and just worship him right now. Come on, ask him. Ask him to touch your heart. Open your mouth. Open your mouth and ask him. Oh, God, help us today. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. You've been kinder to kind than kind to us. Lord, you've been gracious to us. Don't listen to me. Pray. Pray yourself. Say, God.